those guys to sleep in, man. It's a, uh, it's a double-edged sword. It just means that they were up late last night. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, and get going. There's Elky. Um. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about electrophilic aromatic substitution today. Um, it's mostly going to be, we're, we're going to look at the variables and what happens if we have more than, um, if we already have something on the benzene ring that's going to affect the stability of the sigma complex and therefore how quickly the reaction happens and where we put the new substituent as well. So that's what we're gonna spend our time on today. Um, for starters, um, random chemistry questions. Let's see. Cody, you asked about the elastomers coiling up with the same attractive force as the fold proteins. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Van der Waals forces, Van der Waals interactions from um, creating nonpolar interactions. Um, and to some in some polymers, you get the same similar things like um, pi stacking happens, or you can have um, you can have some polar some polar dipole dipole interactions, especially in something like PVC. Um, PVC is polyvinyl chloride, right? So you've got carbon chlorine bonds, which means you've got some polar bonds. And so they're all going to be held together pretty tightly. Um, one of the things that makes plastics stick together so well um, is that uh, is that they are such long molecules it's like dna a little bit dna molecules are so long they have hydrogen bonds holding them together but that's really a small portion of um it's not a small portion it's, it would normally be a fairly insignificant interaction except for the fact that um you have so many of those forces it's such a long polymer that it adds up to being you know a measurable force that's very, very strong holding these polymers together. Um, and so elastomers frequently have, um, they're gonna have different types of intermolecular forces and the way the polymers are, dis are built is going to favor them making these in nonpolar interactions. But when you pull on them, you're gonna pull some of those interactions apart. And then when you release, it's going to try to refold those just like a protein if you put it in the right in the right um, environment is going to refold. So you're absolutely right and that's one of the first cases of material science and and um, chemical engineering was okay how do we how do we take these big long polymers and make them mimic and develop certain properties. Um, Elke asked about Benzodiazepine, better known as, uh, I believe benzodiazepines, the classic is Valium, um, but that entire class of molecules, so Valium, Xanax, um, I'm trying to think of what some of the others are off the top of my head. There's a whole uh, clonazepam, uh, anything that ends in AM um, is going to be a benzodiazepine. Um, and the the aromatic ring specifically is what allows it to sort of mimic the same shape as certain neurotransmitters and become, it's in biochem terms, we call it a um, competitive inhibitor. Um, of course, if I put Xanax in, then I'm going to get all of the click here to buy Xanax. Um, so, Anytime you've got a benzene ring that's got a nitrogen two carbons away, it's going to interact with certain sites, certain binding sites on, on proteins. Um, and so a lot of psychiatric medications have that same shape because it mimics the shape of, um, of serotonin and dopamine 
most specifically, but also noradrenaline and adrenaline are pretty closely related too. And so the way that they interact is still not very well understood. All we know is that when you interact, if you, if you get in the way of those processes, it changes those neurotransmitter um, concentrations in your brain and therefore changes behavioral patterns. Um, and so we don't, we don't know with a lot of certainty what it is exactly. It's, you know, why when serotonin goes up, we, it has, it's correlated to, um, you know, a decrease in depression, but an increase in psychosis. Um, we don't understand those mechanisms. We, we have some broad correlations. Uh, and a lot of our medica psychiatric medication in particular is very, very tentative. We understand the most basic levels, but that's about it. Um, so it's, it's still not totally understood, um, but um, hopeful in the future with more computational power and more time studying these things should um, find some, some more uh, connections there. And then uh, Adam asked about using other metals for dissolving metal reactions. Um, so beryllium, magnesium, calcium, so the second column of the periodic table, they're just not good enough at giving up their electrons. They're not strong enough reducing agents because they already have that full S orbital. It does, they don't have that same, that same ability to really force something to take an electron. Column one is way better at, at giving away electrons. They're much stronger oxidizing agents um, because they have only a single electron to give up which means that throws off our stoichiometry and can make and gives us mechanisms that go look, go through a somewhat free radical approach. Um, but it, it allows us to break up things like benzene that otherwise would be far too stable. Um, and this one, just for fun, you can look at crabs and lobsters and shrimp. Um, most crustaceans, turn pink when they're cooked. And that has to do with a certain protein um, and molecule called uh, astaxanthin, which looks like this. Um, so it's a long conjugated polymer. It's not aromatic because it doesn't have rings, um, but this molecule is pink or red under under normal light um what the reason that crabs and lobsters don't start pink that pink is because that molecule winds up being wrapped up in a protein um and it's not until you cook it and denature that protein that it actually releases this compound and you start seeing the red um actually when this when this molecule is bound to a protein it's actually blue um, and so, but it's released by those proteins when that animal is stressed and then further released when the proteins are denatured. Um, so I've actually read that if you take a live lobster and you put it in a kitchen sink with water and um, that has a little bit of wine added to it, the lobster essentially gets drunk because it's never been exposed to alcohol before and it relaxes immediately and it turns, the claws turn blue. Um, but then if you take it and cook it, that this molecule gets released and it turns back to being, you know, that bright red color we associate with cooked shellfish. What if you kill it before you cook it? Um, well, it's it still, still, you won't see that. Um, you may or may not see that blue color of it relaxing, um, but you will still see that red color because the, but the, by heating it, you denature those proteins. So it's no longer a physical process or a um, biological process at that point, it's just chemical. Okay. I thought that that was a good question too and has an interesting answer, so. And then I saw this the other day, since we're dealing with uh, NMR of aromatics, uh, if you get into high level chemistry, you see things like doublets, they refer to doublets of doublets or doublets of triplets or doublets of doublets of doublets. 
Um, this is actually, these are actually figures from a real chemistry textbook. That's not just somebody making it up, um, which is exact, and it gets really, really complicated with benzene rings, which is exactly why we just refer to that big old mess in the aromatic region as a multiplet. Um, just because you can break it down further, but it gets really complicated really fast. All right, so let's do some review. Got five reactions here. Take a minute, draw your product for each of these. All right, so for all of these, we're starting from benzene. So we just have to remember what we're adding. What is our electrophile in each case? So for A, our electrophile is going to be chlorine. So we're just going to be replacing a hydrogen with chlorine. Fuming H2SO4, that was that really nasty mixture of sulfuric acid and sulfur trioxide. Um, and that is going to add a sulfate group or a, a um, sulfonate group, which looks like an, it's an SO3 molecule essentially. And the Lewis dot structure for it Winds up looking like this because sulfur, remember, sulfur is stable with two bonds, just like oxygen, it can be neutral with two bonds, but it can also be neutral with six bonds because it's got that empty d orbital that it can start occupying. So it's formal charge. Sulfur's formal charge um, is going to be zero when it has six bonds. So this is also a stable molecule or stable functional group. And then if it's neutral, that means we've got an hydrogen on that, that uh, oxygen that only has um, one bond to it. And last but not least on this side, bromine. Bromine in the presence of iron, in the presence of iron bromide, in the presence of aluminum bromide, anything, any metal that can act as a Lewis acid, which is most of them, you're going to wind up forming bromobenzene. All right, so recognizing the cues is the tricky part here because then once you know what the actual electrophile is going to be, you're just taking that electrophile and you're putting it on the benzene ring. If we look at the others, remember nitric acid in sulfuric acid added a nitro group. So we get nitrobenzene. Which is going to look like this. And if we have a Lewis acid, and a alkyl chloride, that's that friedel crafts reaction, friedel crafts alkylation. We're going to just replace the chlorine, or we're going to replace a hydrogen with whatever is attached to the chlorine. The chlorine's going to attach to the Lewis acid, and that's going to make the carbon that's attached to the chlorine is going to be a good electrophile. 
So in this case, we'll just wind up making toluene. And just a reminder that that Friedel Crafts alkylation, we're making a carbocation as our electrophile, which means it can go through a rearrangement. If it was a primary carbocation, but it could rearrange to become a secondary carbocation, some of it will do that. You'll get a mixture of products. So what is going to happen if we already have something attached? This is where things get a little bit interesting. What is, if we're going to go through this reaction, what product are we going to see? We're going to wind up adding a nitro group onto there. It's going to add a nitro group. Um, are we going to see only one product? Probably multiple. I don't know Probably if you can multiple. be that specific with where you're going to attach the nitro group. Right. So there's there's the ortho position. There's the meta position. And there's the para position. Those would all give you a different product, right? So how do we know which of them is going to be favored? Or is it going to be random? Well, that's going to depend entirely on what this existing substituent is. So when we were talking about um, the the birch reduction, turning benzene in and breaking the benzene ring up, depending on whether we had electron donating or electron withdrawing substituents that changed where we where we kept the double bonds and where we put the sp3 uh, carbons, right? We're going to see the same thing here. Electron donating versus electron withdrawing is going to change what type of product we make. Um, and it turns out it'll actually speed up or slow down the reaction as well. If you have an electron donating group, that makes it a more attractive target for an electrophile, right? So an electron donating group will actually make the reaction faster as well because it's easier for an electrophile to come in and attach. And it also determines very, very specifically what products we see. Um, so in this case, this exact reaction, um, this has been measured and the you wind up making the ortho product 63% of the time. And you wind up making the para product 34% of the time. And then there's a little bit of the meta product, but very little. And so these exact numbers are going to change depending on what the substituent is, but we can broadly classify things into two groups where we say electron donating groups are called ortho para directors. It means they're, they're going to put the new electrophile in the ortho or para position 99% of the time. And I'll say this again in a second, so don't don't be too panicked if I'm going fast. Um, if it's an electron withdrawing group, it's called a meta director. An electron withdrawing group is going to put your new electrophile into the meta position almost every time. Right? And we can explain this if we look at what the sigma complex looks like. 
if we look at the three possibilities for um, our new electrophile coming in, if we've got a methyl group on the benzene ring for starting from toluene, if we bring a, a nitro group in and we attach it in the ortho position, one of the resonance structures is going to put a positive charge where that methyl is attached, right? And methyls are electron donating. So a positive charge next to an electron donating group is going to make that positive charge more stable because it's not a full positive charge. You're able to give away some electron density to that positive charge and make it more stable. Just like having a tertiary carbocation was more stable than a secondary carbocation because you had a more electron donating groups around it to make it more stable. And so in this case, the, the actual sigma complex winds up being what determines where we put things because the two positions, ortho and para, are the two positions where our sigma complex can resonate a positive charge to the same carbon that has the electron donating group. The meta position, if you put your electrophile into the meta position, there's no resonance structure that puts the positive charge where the electron donating group is. So it's not stabilized by that, that um, methyl group as much. So the electron donating group speeds things up by making certain sigma complexes more favorable. And so if we look at the what the potential energy surfaces look like, for ortho and para, we have a significant drop in the activation energy because the resonance structure of the sigma complex puts the positive charge next to the electron withdrawing group. The meta position doesn't do that. So it's much larger. And I'll just draw a rough line across. It's much higher in energy. The transition state barrier is much higher to get to the meta product compared to the ortho and the para. And the difference between the ortho and the para is the, the para is smaller even because we the uh, sterics of putting something in the ortho position um, is not uh, as favorable. It's more favorable to put these big groups on opposite sides. But on the other hand, if we go, if I go back to the product distribution, we had almost twice as much ortho as para. Why would twice as much make sense? What do we have, that, uh, what do the ortho carbons have that the para carbon doesn't? Got twice as many of them? Bingo. You've got twice as many carbons that are ortho. There's two ortho carbons, there's only one para carbon. So it actually, that, that uh, relationship being close to two to one makes a lot of sense despite the fact that para technically is going to be favored by the sterics, the fact that you've got two ortho carbons usually winds up counteracting that, unless we're talking about really big groups. If our electron donating group is a T-butyl group, um, much larger than a methyl group, then we might see that, that uh, distribution shift a little bit more towards the para. Um, but in general, we're going to get a mixture of the two. Anytime you've got an electron donating group, which is mostly going to be things with that are only single bonds. Anything that's only single bonds here is going to be an electron donating group because it's going to be able to stabilize that positive charge. All right, and so the 
ortho other ortho para directors that we see are anything where you've got a lone pair directly attached to the benzene ring because that lone pair despite the fact that oxygen is electronegative that lone pair means that we can stabilize that positive charge um and electron donating by way of resonance means that we're still going to favor putting electron density in the ortho and para positions which means it's still an ortho para director All right so amines um alcohols deprotonated alcohols again anything with a lone pair directly attached to the benzene ring is going to be an ortho para director. And for the most part, they're all going to speed up the reaction. Halogens are so electronegative and there's not great orbital overlap for chlorine, bromine, and iodine because they're bigger than carbons. So they actually are going to be, they're going to slow the reaction down, but they're still going to be ortho para directors. So they're electron withdrawing. But the fact that they have lone pairs means they're still going to be ortho para directors. All alkyl groups, ethers, and amines are activating groups, and therefore you will get almost exclusively the ortho and para products. Halogens are deactivating groups, but they can still stabilize the sigma complex because they still have lone pairs that can resonate with, for the sigma complex. And so they're still ortho para directors, despite the fact they're weakly electron withdrawing. Right, so they're the, the weird ones in this case. For the most part, we're going to be able to draw a hard line. If it's an ortho para director, it's also an activator except for the halogens. The halogens are deactivators, which means they're going to slow the reaction down, but they're still ortho para directors. Uh, if you if we have ah um any electron withdrawing groups that have pi bonds. You see the difference between a nitro group and an amine is the fact that the amine has a lone pair directly attached to the benzene ring. A nitro group has a pi bond directly attached to the benzene ring. Those pi bonds make it electron withdrawing. Which makes it a deactivating group. And so our broad case is anything with a pi bond will be electron withdrawing and therefore will be a deactivating group and will only make the meta product. Because if you look at the at the resonance structures, anything with a pi bond, the highest electron densities are going to be where you can never put a positive charge with the resonance structure. All of these resonance structures, these are all happening before our electrophile comes in. And they're going to put a positive charge in the ortho in the para position. And a positive charge in the ortho in the para position means it's going to be less stable, less attractive of a target for an electrophile. Electrophile is not going to come in and want to attach somewhere that's got a partial positive charge. So anything with a pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring is going to have a very similar set of resonance structures, which means that you're only going to see our new electrophile is only going to come in and be added in the meta position.
So which of these is going to be favorable if we have an electron withdrawing group already on the benzene ring? If we've got nitrobenzene, if we put in ortho and para, these sigma complexes look just like the ones we had before, right? Which of these, is it going to be favorable to put a positive charge next to the nitro group or unfavorable? Unfavorable, right? Electron withdrawing groups don't wanna be next to a positive charge. Electron withdrawing groups are fighting to pull electron density towards themselves. They don't, you don't want to see a positive charge next to something that wants electrons. Right, so the meta position gives you a sigma complex where none of your positive charge is never put right next to that electron withdrawing group. So we'll only see a meta attack. And so if we actually did this um, reaction, we would see a small amount of all of the isomers, but 93% of your product is going to be the meta product. Because now instead of lowering the activation energy, having a deactivator slows things down because now it's less favorable to put things in the ortho and para position. So it's not that it makes the meta more favorable, it just makes the ortho and para less favorable. Activating groups made ortho and para more favorable than meta, which is why the reaction goes faster. Deactivating groups that are electron withdrawing are going to, the meta is gonna stay at about the same transition state energy, but the ortho and para transition state air energies are much higher. So the meta position winds up not really ever changing that much. What we're, what's really changing when we change the substituent is the stability of the ortho and para sigma complexes. We're making them more favorable or less favorable. And because the meta is never going to have the same, it's never going to wrote, um, resonate a positive charge towards that existing substituent, the meta position is gonna be the least affected by whatever that existing substituent is. All right, so I'm, I know I've we've been talking and haven't been doing any practice for a little bit. I wanna get through talking about this chart and then the rest, and then we'll take our break and the rest of lecture today is gonna to be practice with this. All right, so this is the, the chart that I pulled up the other day when we were talking about electron donating versus electron withdrawing. Anything, this is not put into the context of electron donating versus electron withdrawing because this is in the context of electrophilic substitution. Anything above that red line is an ortho para director because they all have lone pairs that can resonate. Anything below that line has pi bonds that can resonate. And the pi bonds that can re resonate are gonna make things less stable. Right, so, and there's that slight gray area in the middle where halogens are deactivators, but they're still ortho para directors. And that's because of those pi bonds. Their electronegativity makes them a deactivator because they're pulling electron density away from the ring. But the fact that they have a lone pair means that they're still gonna be ortho para directors. Um, so that's, they are the, the redheaded stepchild, so to speak, of, of uh, electrophilic substitution because they're in between both categories.
for the most part, pay attention to loan pairs versus pi bonds. More than caring, we care more about where we're putting the new substituent than we care about is it an activator versus a director. All right, so let's take a break. It's a little bit early, but we're going fast through these slides. So let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll go, we'll look at this table one more time and then we'll practice with it. All right, this is definitely a table that I would recommend um, putting a post-it, putting a bookmark in or printing out before the, the exam, because this is gonna be one that you're gonna reference a lot. All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 8.50 and we'll start practice with this.
All right. So let's bring it back and recap one more time. So other than the mechanisms and knowing what our, our electrophiles are, this chart is the single most, I won't say it's the most important, it's the, has almost all of the information you need beyond the mechanisms, right? Because this tells you where everything is going to go. If you already have existing substituents on a benzene ring, they're either going to be ortho para directors and meta or meta directors. They're either going to be activators or deactivators. Right. So this is an incredibly important table. And when it comes to ortho para versus meta, lone pairs are what make all the difference. When it comes to activators versus deactivators, um, it's still most, it's electron donating versus electron withdrawing. And anything that's electron donating is going to be an activator. Anything that's an electron withdrawing group is going to be a deactivator. It's going to slow things down. Right, and so the halogens are the ones that are in that gray area in the middle. They're electron withdrawing, so they're deactivators, but they're also ortho para directors because they have lone pairs. So which of the following will react faster than benzene? So go through this, this list and figure out which of them have electro have activating groups attached. All right, so anything with lone pairs that overlap a lot, so anything electron donating is going to be activating. The rest of these all have pi bonds that are conjugated, right? Um, with the exception of bromine. Bromine doesn't have pi bonds that are conjugated but it is a halogen, so it's still a weakly deactivating. So the only one of these that's going to react faster than benzene is F. So that means that everything to the right of the blue line is going to be an orthopara director because those are the ones that have lone pairs conjugated. Everything to the left of the blue line is going to be a meta director because they have pi bonds conjugated. So if we wanted to draw the products, the sulfonation product, and sulfonation is fuming H2SO4.
So we're going to be adding an, an SO3 group. And for A, B, D, and E, it's, they're all going to go into the meta position. So we're drawing those products. Let's do the other side first. So for A, we're going to put a nitro group. And it's going to go in the meta position. So we're going to have our NO2 group. We'll put that in the same spot. And in, the, in one of the meta positions, doesn't matter which one, we're going to add our HSO3 group. All right, so for the for D, it's going to look the same. The only difference is what's attached instead of nitro group that we started from. We had this different looking structure. but it's still a pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring. So it's still a meta director. So we're still gonna see it in the same position. I'll leave that there. So for B, we had a big, big bulky group uh, ketone attached pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring. That's all we're really looking for. That makes it a deactivating group. So it's going to slow things down and it's also going to put our sulfur in the meta position. Right, so it doesn't really matter how the benzene rings rotated because we're always going to be adding things relative to where the existing substituent is. Doesn't matter what the existing substituent is, it's all we're going always going to define it as being ortho, ortho, para, or meta, because that's our, our shorthand way for describing where we're putting the new substituent. Right, so E is going to look very similar as well. We just have a different substituent on there, so it's going to look We have a T butyl group attached via an ester. So we would wind up with this molecule. On the other side of, of this dividing line, we've got ortho para directors. 
So our starting molecules don't look all that different, but because they have lone pairs conjugated, when we add our sulfonate groups, it's going to be in the ortho para position. So ortho would be directly next to the bromine. So something like that. Um, and the para position being completely opposite. So we'd get a mixture of these two products. And for all of these, the other possibilities, there's gonna be trace amounts of those other products. All of these are competing reactions, right? The favored reactions are gonna be the ones that have the lowest transition state barriers, but you're still gonna get a small amount of the others. Um, so we don't we talk about these as being exclusively making these either meta or ortho para products, but really you're gonna get a little bit of everything. Um, but as far as answering a question on a test, my test or anybody else's when it comes to this, um, we can basically, we're gonna make such a small amount of the unfavorable product that we can just ignore it. And F is gonna look very similar. And the only difference between F and E is which way that ester is facing, right? It's a T-butyl group attached via an ester in both cases, but having the pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring versus having lone pairs conjugated with the benzene ring makes all the difference. So we'd wind up making, and this is one where this is a big bulky group, right? So the ortho might be, not be quite as favorable as the para. We're still adding our SO3. then the other product would be putting it in the para position. And so, we're going to get both of these products. And for C and F are going to be the reactions that go the fastest. F is going to be by far the fastest reaction here because it's the only one that has an activating substituent. Bromine is deactivating, it's weakly deactivating, um, but it's still deactivating, which means we're not, it's going to go slower than if it was just benzene. And the rest of them are all strongly deactivating. Having those pi bonds conjugated is a big deal when it comes to these reaction rates.
All right. And so remember that, so ortho para versus meta, that's not a scale. Well, that's just a cut and dry. It's this or it's that. You know, how strongly you favor ortho para versus meta, what is that little percentage that actually gets turned into meta is going to be um, depending on, on where it falls here. But for the most part, we just think about this, this dichotomy as being either or. However, for the activating, we have this weak, moderate, strong in both cases. And that's going to be important if we have more than one existing substituent, because we have to, we're going to wind up with competing effects happening. If a benzene ring has more than one substituent, either the directors are going to work together, um, in which case, so if you had dinitrotoluene and you were gonna add another nitro group, group to it to make it trinitrotoluene or TNT, the nitros are both trying to put the last nitro in the meta position relative to them, which is also the ortho position from relative to the methyl group, right? So in this case, everything's working together. The, the activating agent is trying to put everything in the ortho and para positions and the withdrawing agents are already meta to the last position left, that's ortho or para. So this is, this is actually gonna make it even less or even um, more stereospecific because not only do you have the, the electron donating group favoring putting the nitro right here, you have the nitro groups making the other positions less favorable. Those last two carbons Put it, those, having those nitro groups already on the benzene ring makes putting something on those two carbons very, very unfavorable. So not only do we have the electron donating group saying, hey, put it in the meta position, you have the nitro group saying, hey, don't put it here. Occasionally, though, we'll have a reaction where we wind up with our um, activator or deactivator, our substituent will wind up opposing the other substituent. So if we had an OH group and an alkyl group, those are both ortho para um, directors. So if we were going to add a nitro group here, we can put it ortho to the oxygen, or we could put it ortho to the methyl group. And so we have a, basically we have a, a fight over who gets to sit next to the nitro group, right? And in this case, whatever the most powerful activator is, is going to, is going to win out. So the methyl group is saying, is lowering the activation energy a little bit for its ortho positions, but the OH group is, is lowering the activation energy even more for its ortho groups, right? Because if I go back to that chart, <coughs> excuse me, oxygens with lone pairs are strongly activating. Alkyl groups are weakly activating. So that tells us that our new substituent here is has to go in the ortho position to the oxygen. And so for the example on the top, we're gonna wind up making trinitrotoluene. That last nitro group has to go 
meta to the other nitro groups. And it really does not like the way I'm writing my two there. And down below, again, we're going to see a mixture of products, especially when they're both activating and they're both ortho para. You're going to get a mixture of both products, but the one, the major product is going to be putting the NO2 next to the OH group. Right, and you'll have a significant amount of, of the nitro group in the ortho position relative to the methyl, but most of your product, your major product, will be nitro ortho to the hydroxyl, to the OH group. All right, so let's go through and practice writing these out. So Friedel Crafts alkylation with methyl chloride. So methyl chloride plus aluminum chloride as Lewis acid. If you have two strongly deactivating groups, and no activating groups, we can basically say the reaction is not going to happen. If you have two strong deactivating groups and no activating groups, then we can just say the reaction is not going to happen. There's no favorable place, especially if there's no favorable place. If you have two deactivating groups, but there's still a meta position open, then that um, that's okay. That reaction can happen. But if you have two deactivating, strongly deactivating groups where there are no meta positions open that are that are suitable, then we will say that reaction won't happen. Because the only option that you have is to put something where it doesn't want to go. All right, so you have to have an activating group or you have to have an open meta position if you have a strongly deactivating group. All right, so I'll give you guys a, a head start on these. Say, so I'll give you guys 10 minutes on this. Take another short, this is, I think this is the last slide I have prepared today. Um, so all I was planning on doing is going through this, talking any questions over that you guys have. So let's take 10 minutes, work on this, and I'll come back and we'll work through it together. So I'll, I'll pick back up at 925.
All right, so let's go through this. So Friedel crafts alkylation with methyl chloride means we're adding a methyl group. So for so for A, it's a halogen, so it's weakly deactivating, but it's an or also an ortho para director. So we're going to put a methyl there, and then we're going to get a second product that has methyl in the para position. We have a meta director for B. So we're going to put a methyl in the meta position, either of the two meta positions, because they're equivalent, right? No worrying about axial versus equatorial. Benzenes make thing easy, things easy because they're flat, right? Got another ortho para, or sorry, another meta director in C. So it's a deactivating group. We're putting it in the meta position. We have an alkyl group that's weakly activating. Even though there's no lone pair on the alkyl groups, they're weakly activating because they're donating electron density. So that means ortho para. So we're going to get meta. I'm um, sorry, we're going to get the para and then as well the ortho. Okay, trying to do too many things at once. If we have a halogen and an alkyl group, They're both ortho para directors, which means they're, they're in conflict with each other now because you can't put something ortho to the iodine and ortho to the methyl at the same time or para to both of them at the same time, right? So you go with the one that's activating. The one that's activating or more strongly activating is going to control your product. So that, that'd be the methyl group in this case. So the methyl group. We need the para product and also the ortho product. And for F, they're both in conflict again, right? So if we if we have to choose, these ones are both going to be just about as strong. So really, we're going to get a mixture of all possible products for this one. Probably the major product would be putting the new methyl group ortho to the propyl group. A bigger alkyl group. I guess actually sterics might. This is one we're going to just get a mess of everything. They're all going to be, because the sterics are going to favor putting it ortho to the methyl but the propyl is going to be a little bit more electron donating because it's bigger. So you really have, are going to get a mixture of everything, um, which would be, you know, dimethyl propyl benzene in every different isomer that you can have essentially. For G, we have two strongly deactivating groups, which means they should we should be putting them in the meta position, except that meta to one of the substituents is going to be or, um, para to the other substituent. So this is our, our case of we're not going to see any product here because every position is strongly deactivated. If we had these two and they were further apart so that there was still a meta position that wasn't strongly deactivated, we could still have the reaction happening. But there is no good place there. There are no activating groups that um, favoring one position. All we have is deactivating groups that are taking electrons away from those positions. So no product there, no reaction.
And then H, on the other hand, is also die substituted already. But now, and these ones are in conflict as well, but they're both activating groups. That's the difference between G and H. G, you have conflict between your substituents, and they're both deactivating groups. H, they're both activating groups, so you can still have the reaction happening. So you're going to be putting things in the ortho para position relative to the oxygen. That oxygen's lone pair makes it a much more strongly activating group. Right, so when in doubt, when there's a conflict, whatever is more strongly activating controls things. And if you have no activating groups, if you have a conflict and everything is being deactivated, then that's no reaction. All right. So at this point, this is pretty much all of chapter 18 we've covered in these two lectures. So we're make, moving at a pretty good clip, but I think you guys are well set up for that based on, on how we did last quarter. Doesn't felt like we went too fast necessarily. It just, this part's gonna take practice and you've gotta have that table um, in order to be able to make it make sense while you're studying. Does anybody have any questions at this point. Cody? Yeah, I was just wondering um, if you have multiple different things that are competing, like an activating group and a deactivating group, like if you had uh, like 2,5-dimethoxy benzaldehyde and you were to treat it with like nitromethane, there's like one position that would satisfy one of the methoxy groups and the aldehyde group, but that would be in conflict with the other methoxy group. So you'd like pick a position that would satisfy two of those substituents or? So let me, so say that molecule again. Uh, two five methoxy or dimethoxy benzaldehyde. So two five No, that's that'd be two six. So the so in this case, it, we're going to come back to um, the fact that our deactivating group is it, you. You probably are going to get a mixture of products with this. Probably the the one that satisfies both of them is going to be favored, or sorry, two out satisfies two out of the three. Since both of these are equally activating, um, they're both equally activating. But if we look at so the the methoxy group that's meta to the benzaldehyde or to the aldehyde, that's going to favor putting things right here, right? But that's going to be counteracted by the benzaldehyde that makes that less likely that the, you've got an activating group for those red positions, but you've also got a deactivating group that's making the red positions less likely. So that's going to tell us that the, the favorable place to put this is going to be the one that, that satisfies one of the methoxies and also the benzaldehyde. Okay, I was kind of thinking the same thing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you do have to work through the logic of it sometimes with the activating group versus the deactivating. Remember that the deactivating groups work by making the 
ortho para positions less favorable. So you're, you've got something that's favoring putting some, something in the ortho para to the benzaldehyde, but then benzaldehyde is counteracting that. So it's less that, that the orange position is satisfying two of the three and more that the red positions are counterbalanced basically. There's, you've got one thing favoring things, putting things there and one thing that's unfavorable to put them there, if that makes sense. Yeah, so deactivating groups, uh, probably not phrasing it right, but have a stronger influence on what's not gonna happen and activating groups kind of open up more possibilities kind of thing. Yes, and so that is that is a good way of phrasing it. And in that respect, if, when, they're, when they're counteracting each other, they're basically canceling each other out. So whatever's not canceled out, the activating group that's not canceled out is gonna be the one that controls things. So okay. that's canceled out by that. And so then we're only looking at the positions that are favorable to that one. That makes sense. It's kind of random off topic question about the scope of what we're gonna cover, if you don't mind. Um, I stop, sorry, go ahead. I'm, let me just double check. Does anybody else have any questions about, about this stuff at this, this point before we go on an off topic one? Okay. Uh, then, then hit me, Cody. I just stumbled across a, a reaction. Um, I was just wondering if it was going to be something we cover or if it's a little bit more advanced. I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but it's a, a novenagal condensation. Um, so I do not know that name off the top of my head. Um, that might be a good one to do for your presentation, though, um, that we have at the end of the quarter. I don't think so. The, I mean, the only major condensation reaction we're going to cover is the Claisen condensation. Um, but I don't know that for sure because I don't know which one that is off the top of my head. Yeah, um, I think it, it deals with ketones where uh, one of your reactants has got two hydrogens on it and you make water by taking the oxygen off the ketone and attaching those two hydrogens onto it. How do you spell that last name? K-N-O. Oh, I found it, yeah. Yeah. Um, we will do things, it's a modification of the aldol condensation and we will talk about the aldol condensation. So I had not heard it referred to in this, with this name. Um, but we will talk about it to some extent, um, probably after midterm. I don't think we're going to get to alpha, beta, unsaturated ketones till after midterms. Cool. All right. Well, at this point, I will um, go ahead and, and let you go, guys go a few minutes early. You've got an extra 10 minutes in your day today. Um, if you want to hang around and want to ask more questions about what's going on in our lecture, feel free. Uh, otherwise, uh, take the quiz later this afternoon and have a good weekend.
I think I was going to ask you something about the lab, but it's slipping my mind. Just kind of struggle with the uh, the uh, geometry stuff. Yeah, um, were you were you still in the lab when we figured out how to make MacMol work properly when it came to the Z matrices? As far as jumping back between the the Cartesian coordinates and then back into yeah. the other coordinates, yeah. Yeah, that definitely yeah, helps. Yeah, that for whatever reason that triggers something in the code that makes it work better. <clears throat> well, if you if you think of what your what your question is, I do have office hours at 10 30. Um, so you can always jump back in or hit me with an email. Um uh if you if it's something you can put into an email. Cool. It'll we'll probably come back to me when I start working on it again. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Rob, see you, Cody.